Welcome back to the Placeholder Podcast, everybody. I'm Kaylee Fretz. Fantastic show for you. It is, well, it's just about Holy Week uh, in the in the cycling sense, not the religious sense, a bit of both, actually. Oh, it actually is Holy Week for the religious sense. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> it is right now. Well, I'm, talk- I'm talking about it almost being Holy Week in the cycling sense. It is technically already Holy Week in the religious sense. Anyway, you heard Ronan McLaughlin there. Welcome back, Ronan. Thank you. I'm just wondering which is more important, Holy Week? Well... Speaking as a not particularly religious person, I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you which way which way I go. Dane Cash, which Holy Week do you prefer? Oh boy, this is getting you kind really, of deep. You really going to ask that question in the first? <laughs> one that, I mean, the, my answer is the Tour of Flanders, but I mean, geez, you're really, yeah, breaking it open here. Uh, I mean, you know, like no, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm gonna, I'm speaking carefully here. <laughs> No disparagement upon those who see the world differently. It has always but, uh, it shocked me the way that, I mean, Flanders is a relatively you know, Catholic place. And the fact that they get out for the bike racing on, on that Sunday, that so often is Easter, I mean. It's, uh, so yeah. often is Easter, that's the key. It's not always Easter. It isn't, yeah. yeah, yeah. Not always, but it not often always. is, yeah. Well, great way to start this episode. We have things to talk about. We have bike racing to talk about. We have, uh, well, we have actually lots of things to talk about. We have the Tour of Flanders coming this week. We, all three of us, plus most of the rest of the staff, are headed to Belgium. Well, actually, tomorrow. I'm leaving tomorrow. Uh, landing Thursday, and so we'll we'll all be together. We will do a big Tour of Flanders preview on well, it'll be Thursday, Friday, once we get on the ground and we hear some quotes and we we talk to some riders and we get final start lists and things like that. We'll do a little mini preview today, but. We're really excited about it. I'm I'm very very excited to head over to Belgium, do some riding, drink some beers, watch some bike racing. It's really it's one of the best weeks all year. Let's kick off though with the lead up to this Holy Week. Kent Wevelgem was was last weekend. Dan Cash, we saw we saw probably the most, eh, maybe the second most dominant team display of the year thus far. Talk me very briefly through Gent Welvigam because obviously, if you want more, head over and listen to how the race was won. We're just going to touch on it. Who won? Yeah, well, Lidl Trek rider Mess Peterson won, and if you were paying attention throughout the weekend, you would know that he was less than thrilled with the way that he performed just two days prior at E three. But over uh, again, Welvigam just two days later, he and his team really uh, worked together quite well to take on Matthew Vanderpool. Uh, bit of a, a well-oiled Lidl Trek machine. They had multiple riders putting the pressure on Vanderpool, and then eventually it was Peterson and Vanderpool alone off the front. And in the final sprint, Peterson took the win, and I think he might have done it anyway. He's a fast finisher, but it certainly helped that Vanderpool had had to, yeah, all day long kind of be alert to other Lidl Trek riders, Jonathan Milan even, who's a sprinter, but you know, working really hard earlier wasn't in the race. wasn't riding like one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was very impressive from a rider who I would have thought of as a bunch sprinter, you know, that's it. But that's not what he is. He's more than that. I think, I think Milan's just going to turn into one of those riders that started off as a sprinter, but sort of morphs into, given that he's also a track rider, just morphs into an incredibly strong classics type writer kind of the same way as like i guess Boonen was like the most successful example in recent times but maz peterson himself sort of followed that trajectory didn't they and yes i mean I, I didn't really see much of the race because uh unfortunately eurosport decided only to show 23 kilometers uh of <laughs> of the of men's camp well i think it was 44 kilometers of the women's race which is ever so slightly better so i'm gonna have to just take your word for it there day and that the track we're working that way well, maybe this is a, a an escape after dark thing, but um, I actually think that the the TV coverage here in the states has not been as dire as we as we yeah. once feared it would be. Anyway, we'll get into that yeah later in the show. the The big question that came out of the weekend for me, and this is a big question coming into the next two big races right ahead of Flanders and Roubaix, is Little Trek now the best classics team in the world? Because we thought it was Visma earlier in the year. Previous years, you would have said something like Quick Step, although not really since about 2022 or so. Are they the best classics team in the world right now? Are they are they the team that is going to define what Flanders looks like, for example? I would say they're the best classics team in the world this week. 
I don't know that that's going to extend <laughs> through. That is a hedge. What what kind of talk radio is that, the, Dave? Come on. Uh, I don't know that they are the best classics team once Christophe Laporte and the rest of Visma Lisa Bike are back to 100% healthy. Yeah. But for now, it certainly seems like it. I mean, Matthew Vanderpool himself plus Jesper Philipsen is a heck of a team for Alpecin. But behind those two riders in terms of super strong classics contenders – I don't think they have quite what Little Trek has with the, the Stoyven Peterson, uh, you know, one two punch at the top, and then the uh, incredible Tom Scoinch uh, as well. Jonathan Milan apparently is a classics guy. So, yeah, I think depth wise, they look like they are the best at the moment. I think Trek, Little Trek are just sort of riding a, a crest at the moment with, you know, with Little coming on as a sponsor. There was like a, well, there's bound to have been some sort of, um, reinvigoration of the team. Not that they really needed that, but it just seems like there's a new atmosphere a about that team. A lot of money came in, and a lot of new writers came in along with that. And while that could easily have gone wrong, it seems to have gone really, really right. And when you then combine that with the writers that they already had, like Pedersen and like Stoyven, especially for these races, uh, I think I think they're just in a position where they've got great team spirit, and they're combining that with great team tactics, and the result is riders who are very very difficult to beat uh, I mean if you've got like a, a rider like Milan up the road then you've got a rider like Pedersen getting a free ride behind it's 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 quick step tactics that we've seen a few years ago but it's not really quick step tactics and it's just damn good tactics um, and it, it, it's it's hard to it's hard to combat that even if you're Matthew Vanderpool they also have a really nice sort of spectrum of abilities and this is what Alpecin de Kunic has with Vanderpool and Philipsen where Vanderpool has a very good finish, but Jasper Philipson is, you know, maybe the fastest person in the world. Trek has that, but like times two. They've got a rider like Tom Scoinch who can go off the front pretty far out, put in these attacks to, you know, soften up the Peloton or chase down other people's attacks. Uh, and then, you know, Stoyven, Peterson, Milan, all of them are just a little bit sprintier than the last. And that gives them options for various ways that races might play out. Would you rather have Alpecin the Koenig set up with two of the best riders in the world and a leading group of 10, or would you rather have Little Trek's five, six great riders and some of the best riders in a group of 30 and 40? Ooh. Hmm. Probably the latter? I think I mean, yeah. I think it was so, for a one-day race. Three, two weeks apart, Milan San Remo yeah. and, and, and Gent Welvigham, very different conclusions to the same sort of... Question, I think it's hard it's to control a race like Flanders and having those multiple options makes a big difference. Yeah. And Flanders, you do... Well, I, mean, I guess Milan San Remo, you do occasionally get the... the I shouldn't say strange result, but you know the, the unpredicted, less predicted result that the Mohoric is, for example. But Flanders, you do sometimes get that as well. I mean, I'm like... Betty all think back to like uh, yeah, Betty all is the one that that comes to mind is sort of slips off the front and you know brief moment of hesitation and obviously very very strong rider but you know that definitely not you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have come into that morning saying you know Alberto Betty is the guy you got to follow right can I, can I make a call for Flanders right now based on the question I just asked that is that Jasper Stoyven is going to win <laughs> Tour of Flanders you and a la Stein de Volder style where. He's just got so many great teammates stuck in a group behind, marked, sort of policing uh, any attacks from the, the other big riders, while the other big riders can't really drag like of Pedersen that to the line either. Not to go off on a huge tangent here, but I kind of feel bad for DeVolder. <laughs> and also, I feel like this is true for Terpstra, Nikki Terpstra as well. Uh, Terpstra was going to be like my, my who, example of the exact same thing. <laughs> if they were the very best and strongest riders on that day, which they might have been, we wouldn't know. And all we talk about is how great their team was. But like, but it was still, you know, it was still, they were good playing, playing that tactic that yeah, led to the yeah, wins. It. It's yeah. Should we? Should we just so briefly, just for anybody who forgets, uh, what what year did Devolder win? Two thousand eight and nine. He won two. Yeah, eight, eight and nine. nine. Yeah, two in a row. Right, and it was basically. I mean, pe- people at the time pointed to, oh well, it's just because of Quick Step. It's just because of Boonin, right? And same thing with Terpstra at Roubaix, where everyone was watching Boonin and, and Flanders Terpstra slips off the front and Flanders, and he is gone. And so it's it's a well known tactic, and I think that's you know, Ronan, your 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 Stoyven pick is a is a pretty good one. To take it back to Quick Step, though, because this is the other thing that, that not just came out of this weekend, but has really come out of the last couple of years. Are they even a... They're not a classics team anymore. 
right? Tim Merlier was the, was the top finisher at Get Wevelgem for them in eighth. And uh, so here's my question. It's not like, are they a classics team? Because I think that that has been pretty well solved. Uh, the answer is basically no, right? They haven't done much at all for the last couple of years. They are a Remco Venipol team at this point. My question is, and Ronan, maybe this is one for you as someone with a, with a, a bit more Flemish history. How long will the Flemish people stand for this? Because will they accept winning the stuff that Remco wins and continuing to lose the Tour of Flanders over and over and over again? Or will they at some point demand that that team pivots back toward its its heart and soul? I think the first year that Remco does not win Liège, there is going to be anarchy in Flanders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is an out. He has an out. I think it's a pretty narrow out. I don't think it is an out that's going to happen. If he becomes a Belgian Tour de France winner, I think the Belgian fans will be just fine with Sudal. Uh, but even that, I mean, like, if if a quick step have a spring where they're like non features in any of the spring classics, yeah, it's a it's a long, long time then until the tour that Remco might win. I mean, earlier won it's a second tier race like a week ago. He was second at Brugge de Pen. It's not like they're complete. They're not like. Uh, Covetous or something. Yeah, but the, you know. the like the 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 regular public of Brugge Flanders. D- is- hold, hold on, I'm, my 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 brain's confused. Did you just use Brugge de Pana as a, as a defense for Quick Steps <laughs> spring campaign? You said nothing. You said they did nothing, and I'm pointing out that they are significantly better than probably eighty percent of the teams. Yeah, but the the bar is so high. I think I think using Brugge de Pana for Quick Steps defense is is worse than doing nothing. If Remco wins the Tour de France, nobody cares. I re- I really think that, I, and I don't think that's going to happen. But I whoa, think whoa, that's whoa, the whoa, 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 whoa! Oh no! Oh, sorry, sorry. I I miss I miss it. You you said Remco wins the Tour de France. Nobody cares. That's I I oh, heard yeah, no, that. No, no. As I think no one will care, care if he wins the Tour de France. About their class. If they win, if he wins the Tour de France, they will stop caring about not Which lose is, not winning Flanders. I don't think that's true. I, th- I think Sam Merlier was second in Brugge de Pana is the equivalent of saying it's okay that Remco didn't win the Tour because he won the Tour d'Algarve. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, no. Well, so I, I think uh, it's, it's, it's a genuine question here. I think it's, you know, at some point, at some point building a team around Remco is sort of, it, it goes so firmly against what that team has always been and what Patrick Lefebvre has, where he has always found success that I wonder whether the, yeah, essentially, like whether you call it the public rebelling or you know <laughs> the the journalists of Het Newsblad or wh- whoever whoever is doing the rebelling, I do feel like at some point the public is going to get tired of, uh, uh, frankly, a team that's ch- now chasing GC with a rider who doesn't actually appear to be sort of the GC you know world beater that they need him to be. So I. I I think it's headed for a bit of a collision here. I do think that this team didn't change much of what it was doing in the last couple of years in terms of the way that it's building. It had a rider. It had multiple riders that seemed like they were going to be contending. I mean, Casper Asgreen won the Tour of Flanders. Julian Alaphilippe sort of changed his approach a little, and suddenly now he's focused on the Tour of Flanders. He's doing these races. There was a moment not that – like two years ago where it seemed like Quickstep was going to be just fine – they had youth with Asgreen. They had the very talented Julian Alaphilippe. Neither of those riders has done much at all. Asgreen had a crash and has not really been back at the same level since then. But I think this this is a team that has not adapted quickly enough to the fact that their maybe two bigger stars haven't performed. I, I think it's more than that. I think when you look at their lineup now, like they, the start list for E3, they had Alaphilippe, Asgreen, Lampard, Jenny Moscon, Casper Pedersen. Like they, they have strong riders for that race and, and obviously they've got the alternative program going on at the same time with Remco and his his GC team but I I can't help but think that there's some connection there between Patrick Lefebvre's antics on an ongoing basis and just some sort of fallout within not fallout between the riders or anything like that but just a like uh, surely that stuff eventually just demoralizes the entire group the same way as previously it seemed to like galvanize the entire wolf pack so to speak it seems to me you know it's just like like as green was was he 80 something in one of the races recently where he really should have been a contender and was a contender a couple of years ago you compare that to yeah. as green in e3 2021 where was not the one where he was like caught and then attacks again and still wins or one of the quick steppers wins and 
yeah, there it just seems like a completely different team dynamic there these days. Looking well, from the outside in. And, and he was was he coming back from injury last year, right? And yeah. then he won that Tour de France stage, and so like he he has he, he's made his return. Yeah, right? he's still yeah, pretty and, young. And, yeah, and he is yeah, still pretty young. And, and, I don't know. It's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. I, I think if you're, I, I think there's no question that if you dump the amount of resource into a GC effort that they have, you cannot be the, the, well, particularly with a team with that amount of resources, right? You cannot also be the classics team that you want to be. Like, I think maybe what we're kind of seeing right now with Little Trek is the fact that they are so heavily resourced compared to even just last year that they can try to do both, right? Like they can do the Teo Gegenhart GC thing and they can also do the classics thing, but you need to have pretty deep coffers to to make that happen. Can I give you one counterpoint, a one word counterpoint? Any else? They just batted everything? They just have stacks <laughs> of money and they're not delivering in the same way Little Trek are. I, I definitely think there's some sort of... Uh, I, th- I think Little Trek always have one of the best sort of team environments and team atmospheres in the peloton and i think that's only got even stronger this year and you cannot you can't measure that in watts or whatever but that is a huge huge thing in these races especially let's take a quick break we're going to come back with a little tata pogaccia and peeing in a bush in catalonia Welcome back, everybody. Let's head to Spain, or I guess, well, the Catalans might have something to say about that, but let's head to Catalonia. <laughs> Start with religion, and now you're moving into politics. I mean, come on. <laughs> this we'll is a cycling that. podcast. We'll leave that to the side. I, I, I'm not I, I'm not applying any judgment in either direction. I'm just saying there are people there who would probably take issue with, with that intro. All right, let's head to Catalonia and Tade Pogacar, who, well, Dane, he pretty much won everything he wanted to win, right? Yeah, I think that's an accurate assessment. He won four stages. He won the overall. Uh, it was not close in the overall battle. He basically took a big enough lead early on that it was never going to be close. But then, to his credit, uh, he continued to just keep going for stage wins and didn't just sit in the peloton and you know, you know uh, bide his time and rest on his laurels. Uh, so you know, good for him for doing it. But the, the field there was, we might get into this in a little bit, it was good, but it wasn't great. And that meant that there wasn't really anybody to really adequately challenge him for the overall win. Uh, just a little uh, note, credit where it's due, he also took the points in the KOM. Yes, <laughs> which, so. which makes sense because he did win the only th- four stages. And the only thing that Pogaccia didn't win and he made a damn good effort of trying was the team's classification. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, a, a pretty dominant a pretty dominant display. Uh, no question about that. Also, a, a kind of funny moment. Uh, actually, let's just... Let's drop a little bit of audio in right here, and then we'll explain what you're listening to. Then we decided to, to start to work. We come from behind, me and Domen, and uh, we would like to start to pull at that moment, but nobody hold, hold our wheel. So uh, suddenly we had a gap of uh, like 50, 100 meters, 200 meters, and then yeah, uh, we went uh, a little bit. Then we stopped for and uh, <laughs> hide in the bush <laughs> so the peloton didn't know where we were so yeah, it was just a little bit of fun so that was Tade Pogacar <laughs> speaking about a moment where he accidentally broke away uh, which you know who hasn't who among us has not accidentally broken away from a world tour peloton and then uh, stopped for a little pee pee as he said uh, in a bush and then decided that it would be funny apparently to hide in said bush as the Peloton went by and then the Peloton was confused as to where <laughs> Todd I forgot your head Did he jump out and, and go, that? Ah. <laughs> he rode up from behind and everyone was very confused, which I just, I frankly, I just absolutely love. I, there's the antics of, of Pogi are, are, are something we, we can start to sort of like fill a, a whole story full of them, right? Like we should just start to make a list somewhere because it's little things like that. And the fact that, well, one, he's sitting in that, Doing that interview, he is real cold. If you can see the video, he's sitting there with like a hat on, needs a jacket very badly. Uh, He's freezing and he's still, you know, being decent with the media and telling a funny story and all the rest, which is great. But the fact that he would think to do that at all, frankly, is is fantastic. I 
it's the reason I wanted to bring it up is because it's just one of those little tiny moments that reminds us, I think, how lucky we are to have him in the sport right now. Like he's just fun and he's ridiculously talented and it's great. There are there are just people who accidentally break away from the Peloton and then there's the rest of us who accidentally get dropped from any Peloton. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference <laughs> between uh, the rest of humanity and Tadej Pogaccia. So after Catalonia here, obviously last year uh, did a whole classics campaign, won Flanders. He is not doing that this year. He is instead heading to Altitude for a couple of weeks in preparation for the Ardennes and then a run at the Giro d'Italia. Everyone will remember that. Just scrap everything else we just said about him being fun. Anyway, go on. <laughs> <laughs> this is a reality, I think, of the modern sport, right? And and it, it first came up a couple of weeks ago. We were talking a little bit about this with Wout van Aert deciding to go to altitude instead of racing Milan San Remo and a couple of other, other sort of lead up races to Flanders that he would normally do, right? One of the realities, and and I'm interested to hear you guys' thoughts on whether this is whether I'm I'm connecting these two points correctly, right? <clears throat> So in the sort of, we'll call it the post-EPO era, I'm not going to sit here and say the entire sport is clean, but it, it's def, you know it's not 2001 anymore. In the post-EPO era and, and when altitude has really become increasingly important to the point where riders now feel like if they don't utilize it, they cannot compete. Even riders like, was it Alexander Kristoff said that he's doing altitude for the first time this year because he just can't keep up anymore? That creates these f- sort of odd circumstances though where riders have to go sit on a mountain for a couple of weeks, which means they have to skip a bunch of racing, which Pogacar, you know, he didn't used to do, right? He didn't used to skip much in, in the spring classics. Wout certainly didn't used to skip Milan San Remo all that often. But the need to go to altitude in order to peak for these A races decreases the sort of likelihood of, of these major stars interacting and intersecting at some of the lesser races, which is, I, I, I based on my point here, long-winded, is that I... I don't think it's great for the sport. I don't know what the solution is. I don't know if there is a solution, but I know that Tadej Pogacar not going to Flanders and instead going to sit on a mountain somewhere is not good for pro cycling in general. I I, I get your point. And I, I think you're right. But I, I do think the examples we're looking at are, are maybe not the best ones to, to use in this case because Van Aert, I think, is just for the last couple of seasons – been flying for opening weekend, San Remo, E3, Ghent Wevelgem, and then it just hasn't worked out on Flanders, whether that was form wise or whether that was for whatever reason. I think part of the thing Van Aert would have had this year was just I want to put all my eggs into that Flanders and Roubaix week basket mm-hmm. and, and and you know forget about the other races. He needed uh, to so, mix things up for sure. And so if yeah. you're gonna if you're gonna skip those races anyway and focus on training, then it probably makes more sense to do that at alt- altitude these days. Uh, I think Pogaccia had two years in a row targeted Flanders. I think he ticked that box last year, and that's kind of very much that done. And again, unless he's going to do Basque Country next week and haven't done Catalonia this week, maybe those two don't line up for a a, a run on the Giro. Um, and with the Giro in mind, again, not the best example. Kristoff, very. Quickly, I mean, he's got a lot of birthdays on the clock at this point. I don't know if there's other reasons. Uh, maybe that's why he's considering altitude for the first time. They're looking to um, uh, ignore the the obvious signs of of a of a, the autumn of a career, let's say. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's a alternative. I don't think it's as dire as it could be, given it's about ten years since like Garen Thomas and Wiggins and all first headed off to altitude in preparation for their classics campaigns and. Yeah, I think it's just something that's going to summer on year on year, but I don't think we're ever going to see like E3 turn into a B spec race because all the favorites are away at altitude or something like that. I, I, I'm i uh, glad that it is does seem like it's only a very small number, like an, an elite few who will make the sacrifice of not racing some of these races so that they can do this. And it's the riders who we as the media get you know write about the disappointment of them not winning the monuments uh and that's not many people it's swap and art and yeah maybe a few others but the, the one day racing the big six the big six as we'll get into it exactly in a uh and i think that saves us a little bit because you know it's not like you know the the up and comers like luke lamperty is not going to skip you know whatever classics he might race this year to go he's probably not allowed to yeah exactly and that's good uh or maybe it's not i don't know maybe the team dynamic over there is not good 
uh, as Ronan McLaughlin just pointed out a few minutes ago. But yeah, it, it I oh, I think fortunately for now, it's only those those elite riders. But it, it totally is a bummer, and I think it, it part of the problem is the sort of the monumentification that I really like the fact that we have these five one day races that are easy for me to tell my non cycling friends about because they're familiar with Grand Slams and tennis. They're familiar with the four majors in golf. I guess, you know, live golf changes things slightly. But anyway, that said, I don't think this was the same like 30 years ago. I think before I got into the sport, before I was, you know, a big a fan, I think people didn't take Gent Wevelgem, you know, only like 25% as seriously as the Tour of Flanders. It wasn't as big as the Tour of Flanders, but it was still a pretty big deal. And now I think you're willing to skip that if you think you're you're going to do better at Flanders. Yeah. Like I said, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, I, the, the solution is the thing that we've talked about on this podcast and previous podcasts uh, many, many times, which is sort of a, a more unified and, and a calendar that makes a little bit more sense and, and essentially like forcing the top riders to compete with each other a lot more often. And that's, that's frankly, it's just an impossible thing, nor do I actually think that that would be benef- fully beneficial. There'd be a lot of sort of downsides to that as well. But you know, that, that's, that's how you, that's the solution to the specific problem that I'm talking about. I, I, I don't want to oversell it, right? Like, you know, Pogaccio not racing Flanders this year. He is, he's going to go race the Giro and he's going to race the Tour de France, right? He's got a pretty busy schedule. It's, it, it makes sense to take a bit of time and yeah, go, go to the top of a mountain and hang out and, you know, <laughs> get some altitude in the legs, basically get some training in the legs. Lungs, really? I mean, lungs. Well, heart mm. blood blood <laughs> yeah uh can, can we clarify that they're not going there to get blood and <laughs> <laughs> when you go to Same altitude point. your was it your your hematocrit increases your your red blood cell count increases some something about plasma i don't know i'm not a scientist or medical what's doctor. the process there uh, ronan uh i i don't know the exact uh workings of the the human body so i'm not going to uh, fair <laughs> enough. i'm not going to delve into that the what I was going to say there is just that I think um, I think it's just it's like so much of what's changed in cycling over the last ten years, and that we or teams now understand, riders now understand, coaches especially now understand that the the old formula that was you know ever present in cycling until that point where riders start the season at Bassage and then they do Paris and then they do Milan San Remo and there's a build up and you have to do all these races because all these races are part of the jigsaw puzzle to get you to Tour of Flanders in form that they now realize well actually you don't really need those races in that specific order and you can pick some and you can leave some and it can change from year to year and you can train yourself into the kind of shape to do Vanderpool things at Milan San Remo your first race day of the year uh, whereas you know a Vanderpool-esque rider 30 years ago Milan San Remo was not their first race of the season and if it was they weren't doing what Vanderpool did after the Poggio on that Saturday a couple of weeks ago we should also point out this is not an entirely new, you know, phenomenon. Riders skipping a bunch of races to focus on their very biggest targets. I can think of a certain Lance Armstrong who did that uh, quite often for the Tour de France every year, skipping quite a few of the stage races in the buildup. And I think I think I was different. That was because he had no friends. <laughs> it's too competitive. And he really wanted to peak for the Tour of Luxembourg. Yeah, so uh, yeah. uh, we <laughs> we. I, Let's move on from this. Let's move on from this. I, I just, I just wanted to bring it up as a, as a, ah, just a. The times are changing. You could picture me as the, what you know, the meme with like the Flanders grandpa just sort of yelling at clouds, right? Like that's generally me on this podcast, and I'm doing I think a little bit. Grandpa's of a, right a little now, bit young for where you're at at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm. I'm, I'm just yelling at clouds a little bit because I kind of wish Tadej Pogacar was going to be at, at Flanders. That's basically the entirety of my point right now let's let's keep moving dane the big six yes the big six not to be confused with the big four burger from four lanterns burger chain here in ireland it sounds great not to i was briefly confused by that um but i am no longer confused so thank you ronan the big six dane <laughs> who is the big six what what are we talking about and why are we talking about it and is it maybe seven or five or ten or three 
That's a lot of questions you just threw at me there. Uh, the big <laughs> six, I don't know. It's it's a it's a way that a lot of media outlets are phrasing or or, or creating. They're creating a framework for the top riders in, in men's cycling at the moment, uh, based on the fact that there are six standout riders who seem to win most of the races, which is kind of true. Um, and and they they consistently deliver across the whole calendar. So if you look at the the World Tour Racing calendar over the last two years or so, you will see pretty consistently that there are six riders who are head and shoulders above the competition. And those riders are Jonas Vingago, Tadej Pogacar, Primus Roglic, Remco Evenepoel, Matthew Vanderpool, and Wat van Aert. And Before we delve into this, can I clarify one thing? Is this entirely based on results or those like charisma and... Media coverage and media coverage and I don't know I don't yeah mark marketability and all that sort of stuff. That, I don't know yeah, that the, there there's a I don't know that there's a treatise on on the definition of this that really lays out exactly why you get to be called part of the big six or not. Uh, I think it probably does help. I think that the line is basically if any of these riders stopped to pee in a bush and then hid in that bush and then came back to the Peloton, would we write a story about it? Or well, not even not necessarily us. I don't think we wrote that story. Would cycling media in general write that story? If the answer is yes, you are part of the big six. If the it answer did, is no, I think it did happen, actually. You are not, one part of the, of the big six. not one of the big six recently. But now, now that it has happened, I think you have to be one of the big six to do it, to really get yeah. credit for it. Uh, yeah, and I do think the charisma helps. Pogacar, particularly. Remco Evenepoel has a real knack for getting himself in the media, which I appreciate very much. Um, but yeah, it, these, these are riders that are better um, across the board, uh, that they've proven themselves to be better the past two years. And yeah, some people like to talk about them as a big six. I don't know that I like it as a framework, but it's something that we should talk about because it's I, I see it in a lot of places. I, I think six is just too many for me. I mean... Roglic is questionable at this point. Well, I was just about to say Roglic is questionable, and he's in my he's on my draft pick. Um, there's there's days I I don't I literally don't know how I live with myself knowing that I picked Roglic instead of Vinigo, and, and also <laughs> knowing that I didn't pick Vlasov. Uh, so that's that's an ongoing battle for me. Um, but yeah, I have to admit that he's he's on thin ice there for being a, a top six rider. And then the other one for me is, I mean, when you're considering here, Pogacar, Vanderpool, Van Aert. I'm sorry, but Remco's not in that. Well, that, let me. In terms of results, Remco's not there yet. I don't think. And in terms of charisma, uh, Vinigo is definitely not there. Let me put a counter. Well, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. Not to touch the the charisma and media savvy anything. But in terms of results, I think you're uh, both underselling Primoz Roglic and Remco Evenepoel for for two reasons. The first reason is that Kaylee, you inexplicably refuse to acknowledge the fact that both of those riders are monument winners at Liege, best on Liege, and. That's a big deal. Uh, Kaylee, Kaylee doesn't recognize Liège as a as a monument. <laughs> he doesn't recognize it as like a race. <laughs> it's like a it's a club race. Uh, that's a big deal. And the, also the oldest race in cycling. Like, but anyway, moving on. I, yeah, thank you. Ryan. <laughs> um, Roglic and Evenepoel are both Grand Tour winners, and they both the crushed. hardest race in cycling. Anyway, moving on. Sorry, <laughs> I'm fine with this because as long as there's two of us versus Kaylee, I like those it. are both those are both facts. Uh, but yeah, they're both stage race winners consistently. And yes, they might not challenge Vingo at Tour de France, but if you look at them in one week races, they are always contending for the win right up until Ronan drafted Primus Roglic, at least in his fantasy team this year. But before that, always contending for the win across the board at stage races. And that's, yes, the Tour de France is the big one, but Roglic just won the Giro. Evanapol and Roglic have both won Grand Tours, and they're constantly winning Grand or state one-week stage races that Kayla doesn't care about. And Liège best on Liège, which Kayla doesn't care about. Can I, can I clarify my point? I would still have Roglic and Remco in fifth and sixth in any sort of world ranking. But I think it should be a top a second tier. Four. I think it should probably be. It's a top three for me, or a big three. Are you um, leaving Van Aert out I, as well? Uh, no, I'm leaving Vinigo out as well because, as dominant as he is, he only does one thing. He just he just crushes races and then doesn't even make any like he doesn't stop for a piss in the bush. And so this is the media savvy surprise. thing. I get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I like I like a big three. We were talking before we hit record about where where this might have come from, and and my guess was the fact that there's a big six in in English football and English soccer. Um, it's sort of like the big clubs that have been the big clubs for a very long time, and and they're kind of financially they're kind of pretty well separated from seventh onward, right? 
this is a slightly different scenario, but I, I, I think maybe that's where the, for the framework comes from a little bit. Cause I think if you were just going to sit down and go, okay, well, what is the, what is the group that is better than everybody else by a significant margin in both like physically and, you know, as a as sort of star power, I'm with Ronan. I think you'd probably, you'd do three, maybe four. Can I, if, if this did come from the Premier League, can I ask you who is the Manchester United, who is the Liverpool, who is the Arsenal, the Chelsea, the Man City, and the Tottenham of of cycling's big six? Oh, that's kind of that a fun like question, actually, kind of question. except for most of our listeners won't, yeah, won't care. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a good, that's, but that's we can do it anyway. Point. Ooh, let's do it after yeah, dark. Yeah, I feel like you, yes. yeah, I was just going to say Let's do it after dark. Be All right. Well, that's a good we'll reason not to, to become that. a member. <laughs> we'll come back to that after dark. We will, we will. Who is the Tottenham Hotspur of pro cycling? That is a question that I have never asked myself, but I will do so in about 20 minutes. <laughs> All right. Well, so yeah, we're, we're, I guess our point on this segment was just that we're, we're, we're kind of in opposition to the big six. We don't love this, this framework, uh, but it's, it's an interesting thing to think about and sort of like what makes, what makes a rider part of that group and, and how do you define that? Have group they ever even been in one race together? This is the problem with cycling. Yeah. And this I mean, the, the Tour problem. of France. This is what I was just saying. They've been in the Tour like, of France all together. I, no, yeah, Remco's Remco. never ridden the Tour. Remco, so they haven't nope. all been together. That's true. Well, so Re- but that's another reason why young. Remco is not part of this right. group. He's absolutely not part of this group yet. He may be at some point. But I'm sorry, if you're a GC rider and you haven't even ridden the Tour de France yet, you are not Wait, part that's of the the thing. If he weren't, I think if he weren't a GC rider, I think you'd respect him more. Because he's a two-time Liège winner. <laughs> but yeah, fine. Do what you wish. I, 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 I mean, you know. I'm a collegiate champion, Dane. Am I part of the Big, big Six? Seven. I've never raced Tour de France. Big Seven yeah. is the You're Big the Seven. Boss, whatever you want to be, you yeah, can be colli- part of Big Seven. Collegiate fine, Men's yeah. A 2008. I I, I wanted Bring to it. actually <laughs> mention though what, the reason that we brought this up on on how the race was won this week is that I was very pleased to see Peterson winning the race on Sunday. Much like I was happy to see a couple of other riders who are not quote Big Six uh, winning the past couple of weeks. We saw. Such dominance from Pogacar at Catalonia, which didn't have any of the other big six. Big six. We've seen such dominance from Jonas Vingago when none of the other big six are around that it was nice to see Matteo Jorgensen winning a Perry Nice, Jasper Philipson winning San Remo, and yeah, Mess Peterson. They're all riders. Is it? Is this a? Comp- are they avoiding each other? I Guys, wonder. can I just I do can wonder. I just shatter your worlds for a second, please? Sure. Um, head to head, Evenepoel and Vingard, Vingo. Ramco takes it. Of course he does, because he's won Liège twice. 56.7% according to Pro Cycling Stats with uh, 20 more professional victories than Vinigo. And Vinigo doesn't race other than Tour de France. World champion in two different disciplines. He doesn't he doesn't he doesn't race other than Tour de France, but he doesn't race other than when he wins also. <laughs> which Yeah. <laughs> He picks like three races a year. He shows up. He well, again, I, I like a the, lot. The fact that he hasn't delivered quite the GC stuff yet just makes it, it, it like if he weren't a GC rider at all, I think you'd have more respect for him because then you'd be like, oh, yeah, he's a monument winner and a world champion, all this stuff. But now it's more like, oh, yeah, he's that guy who's like a second tier GC contender right now. Hmm. Yeah, he's not a big six. Anyway, <laughs> we, should, we should we should move on from this little discussion. Uh, everybody out there. Listeners to this podcast, what do you think? One, two questions. How big is the number? Is it the big three, the big four, the big five, the big six, the big seven? And then who is in that group for you? You can tweet at us at Escape Cycling. You can hit us on Discord in the Placeholders channel. Who 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 are they? I know for me it's Big Four Burger next time I pass it around. <laughs> Did you bring one to Belgium? That's that's the only certainty. I personally like the big four. We are now going to take a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. This is going to be the world's shortest Flanders preview because we're going to do a full episode on this on, well, we're going to record it on Thursday. It'll pr- actually it'll probably be up Thursday as well. Dane? The Tour of Flanders is this weekend. It is on Sunday. Are there any notable course changes or anything like that? Still the the, the Quermont Paderberg loops, etc. Yeah, in terms of what is actually going to decide this race, I think it is fair to say it's it's the big 
the big stuff we're used to. It's still the Claremont Paderberg double at the end of the race. Uh, that's the big four. <laughs> the big two. I think that's although they go over twice. multiple times. So that's so four. That, uh, yeah. that really adds a whole other element. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think in general we're going to see the same stuff. There are some small changes to the route. Uh, there's, I think, one more. Is there one more um, Berg this year? Technically, yeah. It, it's there. There are first of all, they're going from Antwerp to Audenarda this year, and of course, last year they went Brugge to Audenarda. Bruges, Bruges to Audenarda. They switch every year. Yeah. Um, but does that impact who is going to win in the end? I don't know. I'm, I guess there's. I'm sure there are people who will say yes, but I think the, the whoever no. goes over the Cremont Paderberg. I, I mean, unless there's uh, severe winds or something coming out of Antwerp on Sunday morning, I can't imagine that's going to have all that much impact. It, it did a couple of years ago, didn't it? Vanderpool missed a split near the start, and was that last year or the year before? That was last year, wasn't it? Vanderpool missed a split near the start, got yeah. back on. Pogaccio beat him in the finale. Did that missing the split? cost yeah, and yeah. prices energy who knows anyway we're kind of previewing a race that we've got a preview <laughs> podcast coming for <laughs> this is true that's that's really the that's going to be the extent of the preview uh give me give me dane give me three riders who might win uh, that i think that's actually pretty easy to do i think i can name the three favorites i'm not saying that i uh strongly feel about them over anyone else but it's vanderpool van art and peterson are the are the riders who you will win the least money if you if you bet on them. Put it that way. Uh, and I think coming out of this past weekend, Vanderpool and Peterson looking very good. And Wow Art is the one where we're all wondering, okay, you just went to altitude. Where's that form? Uh, unfortunately for Van Art, he crashed on Friday and we didn't really get to see uh, if he's got the same level of top end speed that he might be bringing into Flanders uh, because he crashed at probably the worst possible moment in the race. Um, so yeah, maybe he's flying and we just missed it because he had to remount and put his chain back onto a better gear. Anyway, I think those are your big favorites. Um, and none of the, none of the other uh, big six are, are racing. So it's irrelevant. Don't, uh, don't say big six. Uh, there you go. That was, uh, that was world's shortest Flanders preview. We will be back before we move on to the bat. We, we, we do have to mention that um, while, while Dame was talking there, I quickly looked up uh, Ronde van Vlanderen on pro cycling stats and filtered the start list by class, best classics writers and was looking for my pick Jasper Steuven and I found him in ninth place and one place ahead of Jasper Steuven and the best classics writers riding the Tour of Flanders this weekend is Tom's Scoins in eighth. Ooh. Big one. What do you think, Tom's? Mm. Tom's for Flanders this year? I mean, if, if Steuven can use that tactic, there's yeah, no the reason Yeah, the way that Tom's we describe can't. Trek's game plan, absolutely. All right. That's that. There's our there's our 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 hot pick there. We got to do a bit of weekly pain before we wrap up today's show. Of course, I should I should also mention. Like I said, we're gonna do a full full preview of the men's race later this week, and Abby and crew will be doing a full preview of the women's race on Wheel Talk. Of course, this week. Also, I totally forgot to mention this. We've got a brand new podcast as part of the Escape Collective Podcast Network. All right, this is going to be the first episode of this new series I'm doing on the Escape Collective called The Rest Day with Jack Haig. I'm here now on the day before Welt Catalunya with Wout Pools. Both of us raced Paris Nice and Torreno last week. And I thought I'd get Wout on to discuss a little bit of the differences between the two races, what both of us like about each race, because I think. You've done both races before, right? Yeah. I was looking on Pro Cycling Stats. I think you've done Terreno eight times and Paris Nice three times. I think that's correct, yeah. Well, how about we just start <laughs> off by by talking about uh, this year's race? Jack Haig, friend of the pod, friend of Escape, lifetime member of Escape, uh, also a podium finisher at the Vuelta a España, rider for Bahrain Victorious. He's kicked off a new podcast with us called The Rest Day with Jack Haig, and the first episode just dropped over the weekend. So go check that out. It'll be, I think it'll be a great show. It's going to be him chatting with roommates, chatting with, I think the next, the next one's actually chatting with his bus driver, which is super fun. It's supposed to be sort of a view from inside the Peloton. Uh, or maybe not even inside the Peloton, inside the circus, including, you know, inside the hotel, inside the bus, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's a great show. Go check it out. The Rest Day with Jack Haig. You can get it in the same channel that you get this podcast if you're listening to the sort of the main big escape channel. 
Let's head over to Weekly Pain. We have our returning champion, Aaron, and I believe he takes on Dane this week. Let's see how it goes. Welcome back to Weekly Pain, everybody. We've got Aaron Humphrey back to take on either Dane Cash or Johnny Long. It was a decisive victory over Johnny Long last week. Uh, in fact, I think our, our first concession, our first forfeit from Johnny <laughs> last week, just couldn't think of the last blue team, which was Jayco Alula, of course. Aaron, who do you want to take on this week? I'll take on Dane. How about that? Uh, all right. All right. And this, this is one. this is where I get my head kicked in. <laughs> I appreciate is, that, but I don't think that's going to happen. Knowing Kaylee and knowing what category he's going to roll with here, you don't know what category I'm going to roll. Oh, with. I thought uh, you were so, hinting to a, a something earlier. That okay? All right. No, 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 no. I do have a couple. I have a couple options. No, I think frankly, Aaron's Aaron's remembering of the sport from last year, I think, was 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 really quite Solid. good. So let's uh, let's open this one up. The category is pay close attention to this one riders with the most leaders jerseys in grand tours that means if a rider wears a jersey for a day that counts as one right two days would be two uh that includes gc points jerseys kom jerseys and youth jerseys i'm looking specifically for riders in the top 20 of that ranking Ooh. that are currently racing. Active racers in the top 20 that are currently... Sorry, active racers in the top 20 of most leaders' jerseys worn. All right, any jersey. In Grand Tours. And every day is an additional mark on the uh, tally on there. Yes, so think about it as like... like Every day that they stood on a podium and, and someone handed them a jersey is a is a point for them. Awesome. Right? Uh, well, let's uh, let's start with let's start with Dane this time. Dane, give me a name. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Jonas Vinkigo. That is correct. Although this might shock you, uh, he's 20th out of the top 20. Ooh, right close. Wow. Barely snuck in. Barely snuck in. And this is Grand Tours. This is Grand Tours only, and okay. again, like so. So the one that that you need to pay attention to is like a yellow jersey and a white youth jersey. Same amount Same. of points here, right? right. So mm -hmm. that's why that's why. Well, that's why Jonas Van goes and is in twentieth. Aaron, over to you. Uh, let's go, Pogachar. He is. He's third, actually. He's worn quite a few. Dane. Primoz Roglic has to be up there. Roglic is fifth. Back to you, Aaron. Uh, Philipson. Oh. Nope. Oh. Sorry. Uh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Incorrect. Incorrect. Philipson is, he's near there. He's, he's in 29th. Uh, Close. With 20, 22 days in points. Jerseys. Close, but not close uh, enough. Yep. So number one, hold on, let me pull this up. Chris Froome, Johnny. Number one is Chris Froome. Froome, that's a good, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, actually, this list I have is incorrect. It's got Peter Sagan in, and he's no longer technically active. So uh, uh, if I bump everybody down one, <laughs> then Jonas Vingo is nineteenth. Uh, so yeah, Chris Froome, uh, Pagacha, Cavendish, Roglic, yeah. Quintana, uh, Bernal. Oh, yeah. Is Simon yeah. Yates in there somewhere? Yep, Evenepoel, Simon Yates, Joao Almeida, Arno Demar with forty-one days in points jerseys. Wow, the Giro. <laughs> wow, never yeah. actually won it. Yep. Yeah. Oh yep. right, oh, the Giro. Sure, 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 the Giro. Uh, Jungle Bob, uh, Bob Jungles with eight days in in leaders jerseys or er, GC jersey and thirty days in in youth jerseys. Ah. Ala Philippe, Carapaz. Miguel Angel Lopez, Garrett Thomas, Elia Viviani, Julia Ciccone, oh, with yeah. a ton of days in KOM jerseys. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a fun Oscar Sevilla. Uh, <laughs> There's a still active. from the past. He'll be still active, active forever. Yeah. <laughs> still active, technically. Uh, so Oscar Sevilla, Vingago, and then Michael Matthews. That's that tough. That is our list. That was tough. That's a tough one. Yeah. That is That tough. was a really a good tough category. One. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, Aaron, 
you got two weeks out of it. Congratulations. Uh, I th- what did we say that the, the, the prize was for two weeks, I Johnny? I don't really hat, remember. A hat or something? Might have to go back and listen. We'll have to go, we'll have to go see <laughs> yeah, what we I said. Yeah, I have no recollection time. at all. <laughs> 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 well, Aaron, we'll we'll uh, we'll be in touch. We'll get you a free, I don't know, escape T-shirt, escape hat, something like that. Thank you so much for joining us on this weekly pain. Uh, yeah, and if anybody else out there wants to take on our esteemed reporters here, you know how to do it. There's a, there's a little link in the Discord. Jump right on it. I feel like esteemed makes me feel really good. So thanks, Kaylee. You really made my my morning here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back to the show. Tough luck, Aaron. Tough luck. But, you know, you take on Dane and uh, you you put your future in your own hands. I feel extra bad. Dane's hands. He was very patient (laughs) with us setting this up. So we really appreciate you, Aaron. And that was a lot of fun. And hopefully we'll see you out on the roads of Colorado at some point, fellow Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he hit me up because uh, I think one of his, maybe one of his kids is racing high school mountain bike yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I coach high school mountain bike stuff. And so, yeah, he actually sort of offered up uh, uh, some logistical help when we had to the state championships later this year. So thanks to Aaron yeah, for I can that. Just as picture well. Achilles coaching and think, you don't need arrow, kids. <laughs> <laughs> you don't it's need mountain- a new bike. <laughs> it's mountain biking, Ronan. You really don't. <laughs> well, that's not actually true anymore. But. I would say that 16-year-olds racing the high school state championships probably don't need to worry about the the aero socks all that much. It's more about having fun, creating lifelong cyclists, you know, important stuff like that. Anyway, thanks, everybody. Lifelong aero cyclists. Lifelong. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everybody, for joining us this week. Of course, this is where the podcast cuts off. If you are not a member and you're not listening to the member feed, we do thank you for listening. As always, please do give us a like, give us a share. That's really helpful for spreading the news. Uh, you know, if you're, we absolutely understand that some folks are, are for whatever reason, you know, don't want to pony up, can't pony up uh, to become members. If that, if you're in that category, maybe just share us, give us a, give us a review, five stars, please. That does help this podcast grow, helps support Escape Collective, and yeah, keeps this whole thing moving. Now, if you are a member, we're going to head into Escape After Dark. Here we go.